Okay, welcome back from your long break. Uh, so we will get started on a new doctrine now, doctrine of God. All right. So um, during the break, someone was asking me uh, whether there are any books available, you know, on these topics which we covered for the earlier doctrine, doctrine of the Word of God. Um, now there are formal books which talk about the doctrines. I'm not sure to what extent you would be interested in that but then in the on the internet you have a lot of articles just which talk about how the old testament was formed how the new testament was formed uh, the care which was taken in transmitting the uh, bible scriptures so even if you know if you just simply type in the in google search saying transmission of the old testament it will show you a whole bunch of uh, blogs um, you know, which will which will talk about that. So these are simple, easier ways of you know gaining information. When it comes to uh, the alleged contradictions that people talk about, how they make how they allege and say that there are contradictions in the Bible. How do we answer that? Well, what is the actual answer to those difficult Bible passages? Uh, there are books available, uh, you know, in um, online even websites which provide information like that. If you were to type in Google and say, you know, uh, difficult Bible versus explained, it will actually give you some websites where it will cover some, you know, main criticisms which are raised and it will give you an explanation of how to understand those particular verses. So you could type something like that in Google. Um, there's a book called Bible Handbook of Difficult Verses. Uh, that you know, um, uh, can be helpful. Uh, so there are, uh, so even if you were to purchase one of those books, you know, a, a book which deals with, uh, you know, alleged contradictions, a book which explains difficult verses, even if you were to buy one such book, it will in fact cover, you know, all the contradictions which are generally pointed out in Genesis, all the contradictions which are generally, uh, you know, which critics touch upon in, uh, in Exodus. So like that, uh, it would be a good, useful book for you to invest in. So, you know, um, there are resources available, but then you would have to spend on them. Um, all right. So we'll get into the doctrine of the of God now. Uh, we'll begin with the what the Bible says regarding the existence of God, how the Bible throughout uh, very clearly talks about uh, the truth of the existence of God. Maybe we can start with Psalm 19, verses 1 to 2. Psalm 19, verses 1 to 2. So either online or in the class, if someone could read out for us, Psalm 19, 1 to 2. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show and proclaims his handiwork. Day after day pours forth speech, and night after night shows forth knowledge. It says here in these verses that the heavens are speaking, that the heavens are declaring the glory of God. It says the skies are openly proclaiming and saying, look, look at the work of his hands. According to this verse, day after day, uh, all these, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the creation, the stars, the, the skies are pouring forth speech. That's the word which is used. It's like as if the day after day, continuously, they're talking about who God is and what God has done. And it says night after night, they reveal knowledge. So these two verses, Psalm 19, 1 to 2, are openly saying that even if a person doesn't know anything about the Bible, if they were just simply to open their eyes and look at the skies and look at creation and look at what God has made, that will automatically speak to them in their hearts if they have an open heart and help them understand that, yes, someone must have created these things. These things didn't just simply come into existence. So we have um, creation proving, talking and proving that someone has made it, that there is a uh, there, there uh, person who is behind the scenes who has brought it into existence. Um, there's this, um, you know, um, 
a long time ago in the 1980s, there was this conference on science and religion. Uh, it was supposed to be more like a debate where the scientific community would uh, express their views on creation and um, you know how the world came into existence and all of that. And then um, on the other side, you would have the theologians who would present their side. So it was in 1985 that one of those conferences on science and religion were conducted. Uh, at that time, one of the uh, very reputed cosmologists uh, was someone named Alan Rex Sandage. Uh, now, this man uh, had spent most of his life studying the cosmology, which is basically your sky, your planets, your stars. He had spent his entire life studying those things, uh, you know, studying the theory of the Big Bang and all of that. Uh, so when the conference was conducted, he was supposed to be one of the main speakers at that event. And um, uh, at the conference, you basically had people being seated on two sides of the hall. So on one side, you had all the theologians being seated. And on the other side, you had the co scientific community being seated. So then when Alan Rex Rand Sandage made his entrance, he went and sat on the side of the theologians. And everyone was rather surprised because they knew that he is supposed to be an atheist who doesn't even believe in the existence of God. And uh, so when it was finally his turn to go forward and speak, he said, I have studied the Big Bang Theory my whole life. I have studied the stars and the constellations my entire life. And after having studied these things in great detail, I am convinced that there must be a God. They must be a creator, which is why I'm sitting on the side of the theologians is what he said. And at that time in, in the 1980s, that caused quite a stir because he was a very well-known name at that time. And uh, they were he was a man who uh, very strongly proclaimed his atheism. But then just simply studying nature, simply studying the skies day after day, you know, the, the skies are pouring forth speech. And finally, this cosmologist heard what creation is saying. And he realized that, yes, God does exist. There must be an intelligent designer who designed all these things. There must be an intelligent creator who brought these things into existence. Um, uh, because the what science puts forward uh, is that you know there was just this big bang of some kind of uh, atomic particle. And then everything just got scattered. Matter got scattered into space. And then one fine day, pieces of matter just came together to form the solar system. And uh, one small piece which came together had all the exact right conditions to support uh, you know, life. Because most of the other planets, if you know, you know they, don't, they don't support life. The elements which are there, the gases which are there in the atmosphere don't permit living forms to, to actually grow on those planets. But one tiny little thing which came together, it had all the exact correct elements. It had all the exact gases in the atmosphere required to create a planet which will be able to support life. So it seems rather random. You know, if you were to go to those same scientists and tell them, you know, I'm, I'm going to just, you know, take this uh, packet of popcorn. And I'm just going to fling it out. It will fall all over the place, but don't worry. All the pieces of popcorn will come together you know, to form your name. It's ridiculous. I mean, it, it, it cannot happen. No scientist would be willing to accept that a packet of popcorn would have the intelligence to behave in that way and put itself together to create a name. But they believe that that is what the Big Bang Theory did with all these huge chunks of matter which got you know, uh, flung into space. How, when they're not willing to accept that at a, at a minor level of one packet of popcorn, how are they willing to accept something like that when it comes to uh, a larger extent where you have uh, entire masses of material which were flung in different directions and they came together to form a solar system which will be so exactly positioned that it will be able to support life on Earth. So. Anyone who has understood enough about these scientific details will realize that God must be existing. There must be an intelligent creator who made these things. Um, so why are people still refusing to believe even after seeing the scientific evidence for
for the existence of an intelligent creator why do they resist romans 1 18 to 20 the simple straightforward explanation about why people continue to say that you know god is not real uh, romans 1 18 to 20 if we can have someone read out For God's holy wrath and indignation are revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who in their wickedness repress and hinder the truth and make it inop inoperative. For that which is known about God is evident to them and made plain in their inner consciousness because God has shown it to them. For ever since the creation of the world, his invisible nature and attributes, that is, his eternal power and divinity have been made intelligible and clearly discernible in and through the inner things that have been made. So are without excuse. Yes. So here it says in verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. You know, so NIV sometimes brings out uh, the uh, wording more clearly because it has it, it wants the reader to understand what is being said. So here it says, the reason that people are able to plainly understand the things about God is because God has made it plain. How, in what way? Since the creation of the world, the things which are invisible about him, which cannot be seen about him, those things are seen in the things which he has made. So his sovereignty, his all-powerful nature, those things are seen in the way the creation was put together. So it says here in the last portion of verse uh, 20, people are without excuse. So it is the evil in their hearts which makes them continue to say, no, there is no God because they are afraid that they'll have to answer to God for their everyday lifestyles and their choices. Uh, now, this is something which actually occurred. Lynn Anderson, a Christian writer, um, he, this is what he writes in one of his books. He was having a conversation with an atheist and he was very logically trying to present all the facts of the universe, you know, which show that there is an intelligent creator who has made these things, who has, you know, very specifically put certain things in certain places so that uh, life it becomes possible on earth. So even as he was explaining all of this, the atheist kept, you know, putting um, uh, arguments forward, trying to dismiss everything that Lynn Anderson was saying. So after a long discussion, Lynn Anderson uh, basically asked him this. He said, is the problem that you can't believe or is it that you don't want to believe because you believe, uh, because if you believed in God, you would have to change your lifestyle. He point blank asked the man, why are you going on setting aside all these very, very logical pieces of evidence about a creator? Why? Is it because you can't believe? Or is it that you don't want to believe because if you believed, then you would have to change your lifestyle. And the interesting thing is that that particular man, you know, with whom he was having a discussion, he sat there, thought quietly for some time, and then very frankly said, look, right now I have a very successful business. And yes, I'm kind of um, you know, um, skirting aside some of the laws which I should be following. I am bending some of the rules, and my business is going very well. If I believe in a God, then I will not be able to do these things anymore. And then he, in fact, went on to say, um, all the affairs that I have been having behind my wife's back, I would not be able to indulge in that anymore. So it would be more convenient for me if God did not exist. The man actually plainly actually said that to Lynn Anderson. So the reason that people still hold on to the, uh, to the theory of evolution, the reason that people would prefer to have a big bang, uh, where just things came together after the bang, they, they hold on to this because if they were to admit that there is a creator, then they would have to admit that they have an obligation to this creator. They are his created beings. And so they come under his 
leadership and they would have to submit to whatever he is saying and they are not willing to do that um, you know those of you who are more interested in uh, in these things and would like to look into this um, you know in, into the the evidence which is available in creation which talks about the existence of god uh, some good websites that you could go to uh, there's something called bethinking.org okay bethinking.org uh, one minute apologist.com there's something called one minute apologist which is just one minute videos he will give you an explanation about uh, something which talks about uh, you know um, the existence of god or how science is proving what is there in the bible so he will you know that's called one minute apologist.com there's also something called creation.com uh, these are the more simple you know the ones with simpler english easier to understand uh, there are a lot of beautiful websites but i felt that these are more uh, you know uh, lay person friendly you know it's easier for a lay person to understand what is there so they have videos they have articles things like that in these uh, websites so you could try them out um uh, there are some things that i cannot really mention on um, on um, you know if you were to look at your stream page later i'll put some information there which can be helpful to you know the google students um, and um, yeah um so if you look at the bible and you look at Genesis 1:1, the very first verse in the Bible. Uh, it doesn't begin with a question: Does God exist? Should we try to find out any evidence for whether He exists? No such, you know, long um, um, sentences are included in the very beginning of the Bible. The Bible begins with the words "In the beginning, God." So it's just assumed as a fact. It's accepted as a fact that in the beginning. God was already there in the beginning. God was already there, and it goes on to say that He created the heavens and the earth. So uh, the Bible has been very clear right from verse one that God exists; that there is no need to even doubt it or even have any dispute regarding this matter. In your textbook, there are three traditional proofs that people give for the existence of God. It talks about three things in your, you know, in your notes. It talks about the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, and the moral argument. Um, so, just basically to uh, you know give a brief explanation of those three terms, so that you know what is being talked about. The first one, the one that's called cosmological argument. Basically, this argument says that every known thing in the universe has a cause every known thing in the universe has a cause so if something has started existing something must have caused it to come into existence that's basically what it's saying if anything at all exists something must have put that thing over there for it to exist so in other words if anything has got a beginning it began because something caused it to begin Okay, so that that uh, basically putting the putting it in very uh, simple lay terms. One morning, if all of you were to come down over here for your class, and when you come over here, you see a cow standing over there. Will you say, "Oh, you know, uh, it just materialized out of thin air"? No, nobody, no student would say that. They would automatically realize that someone has gone to the effort of bringing the cow down the staircase. So something just doesn't simply happen. Everything that exists has a cause. A causal agent has caused it to start existing. So anything that began, began because a causal agent caused it to begin. OK, it's one way of putting it. Um, now, this doesn't apply to God because God was there before the beginning. He is outside of time. Everything that began, you know, everything he created, once he created it, it started to exist. But he was there before time. So he never had a beginning. So this principle when you, in which you say that everything that has a beginning began because something caused it. Yes, everything that began, something has caused it to begin. But God doesn't have a beginning. He was there even before the beginning. 
which is why in you know, Genesis 1, 1 it says, in the beginning, God created. But he was there even before that beginning. Okay, so God, time doesn't apply to God. He's outside of time. And uh, so the first argument which is made, the first traditional argument which is generally provided for the existence of God is that we should use our common sense. If we see that something is, has, exi is existing, if you see a cow existing in the classroom, it means that something must have caused it. The cow didn't just suddenly materialize. Someone has brought it there, caused it to be over there. Okay, so the second argument is in your no notes is called the teleological argument. Now, this basically uh, means, uh, this argument is basically saying that Everything in the universe that we see seems to have harmony. It seems to have order. It seems to have design. So all this clearly indicates that there is an intelligent designer, that there is an intelligent creator. Um, this one uh, person, uh, Michael Behe, he's, he's a well-known speaker. He speaks in many places. He was actually a biochemist uh, who spent most of his life studying the cell oh, um, the cell you know, if you have, if you remember your science from school cells are called the building blocks of life everything which exists is made up of cells so the cell is the most basic structure when darwin wrote about cells in his you know writings back then he actually had no clue about what a cell really is so he said you know oh matter just came together and one cell came into existence but if you understand a cell the way you know we know a cell today it is so intricately designed every single detail in that cell has to function in a, in a particular way for that cell to continue being functional even if you remove one factor change it slightly this way and that way the cell will no longer be a cell it will just be a piece of dead material so michael behe was also an atheist who did not believe in God. But when he began to uh, study cell structure and the way the cell functions, he realized something so complex cannot just come together. Because Darwin, you know, he didn't know much anything about cells. He just thought it came together. But after having studied cell structure and cell function, this my biochemist Michael Behe, he says, it's impossible for, a, for the first cell which was you know, which came into existence, for it to have come into existence without the help of a designer, someone who actually designed it and made it work in that particular way. Uh, so some of these websites you know, will talk about such things, you know, the ones which I mentioned, will talk about these things. Um, so that is basically your teleological argument, which says that the harmony and the order and the design which exists in the universe proves that there is an intelligent creator. The third argument is called the moral argument. Um, uh, you know, the request over here is that maybe I could post information on the classroom page. I have no clue what a classroom page is. Uh, all I know is that in Google Classroom, there's something called stream page unless that is the classroom page. So I'll put it in the stream page. All students of APC are supposed to know what the Google Classroom stream page is, because that's basically where I post the link for the class every single day we have the class. Okay, Over there in that same stream page, I will put um, some information uh, which I cannot give out now. All right, so I will do that. Yes, definitely. And if I don't, you please remind me. Okay, yeah. okay the third argument, the moral argument, basically is this. All humans seem to, in whichever culture they belong to, however remote they may be, you know, removed from the rest of the society, they all seem to have an awareness of right and wrong. There's, a, there's an awareness of that which is inside the people's hearts and minds. Even if somebody is not taught, you know, a, a class on ethics, they instinctively know that some things are correct and some things are wrong. Now, this would not be possible unless there was a creator who put that value system inside our hearts. So the example that is used is of, you know, um, 
those very remote cannibalistic societies which exist in some very remote tribes. In those tribes, uh, the people, they actually believe that they can kill other humans and eat their flesh. Those are your cannibals. But even in cannibalistic societies, what is the uh, principle which they follow? When there is a war with another tribe, they will kill the people of the opposite tribe and cook them and eat them. But they will not do that to their own tribe members. Why? Because even they, people who eat flesh, human flesh, even they in their hearts, they know that murder is wrong. So they don't permit it within their own uh, communities. They, are, they, are, they recommend that you go and eat the flesh of your enemies because you know it's their belief system that the uh, strength which is there in the enemy will pass to them if they feed on the flesh of the enemy or some such um, you know, belief system which they have in those uh, remote tribes. But even they, I mean, even, even in their backward minds, they know that murder is wrong and they will not allow it within their own community. So every human being is programmed with a sense of right and wrong. From where did it come? Obviously, someone would have programmed us to be that way. Because you see what the people who for, believe in evolution, what do they say? They say, oh, culture, you know, society began to be formed, people began to come together, and then they decided, they decided that they need to have a bunch of rules because if there is no rules, then, you know, there'll be disorder. So people chose to follow whatever set of rules they liked. Which is why there's no one standard, absolute set of rules is what they say. But if you apply that to this cannibalistic society, even that cannibalistic society which came up with a set of rules, even they instinctively know in their hearts that murder is something sinful, it's something bad. So who put these you know, uh, absolute moral absolutes in our heart? It indicates that there is a creator who has placed this kind of ethical values inside us, uh, you know, which we cannot escape from. So um, these are the three arguments that are traditionally generally given uh, regarding the um, existence of God. Now let's come to the nature of God, the qualities of God, the attributes of God which are mentioned. We will be looking at this in uh, greater detail. Uh, this is one of the doctrines that I enjoy the most because it talks about our God. And when you start looking at all the scriptures which talk about our God, you get to realize how beautiful he is. So you'll feel like you know, stopping the class and having a time of worship. It's amazing the kind of God that we worship, the qualities that he has. He is so amazing, so awesome, so beautiful. So we will uh, spend a lot of time looking at the different attributes, the different qualities of this living God. Now, we would, of course, have to begin with the statement that God is creator and God is eternal. Um, let's just maybe look at one verse from the Old Testament, Psalm 90, verse 2, 9, 0. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were brought forth, forever you had formed and given birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. It says here that before the mountains were born, you know, before the mountains were created, before you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting. Now, the term everlasting doesn't have a beginning. Everlasting means everlasting. If something begins, it's not everlasting. So which is basically over here talking about infinity. God was always there. So there was no beginning for God. He was always there from everlasting to everlasting. Um, now, just to, you know, um, to clarify something that uh, a question posted, uh, you know, someone has asked, are there any written notes on inerrancy? The thing is, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, APC uh, notes which you have with you, that's basically a very brief summary of the textbook by Wayne Grudem. W-A-Y-N-E-G-R-U-D-E-M. Wayne Grudem. Uh, that is the book on 
uh, systematic theology, which you know that person wrote in the 1970s. So the English is a little high, a little old fashioned, but that's generally considered the standard book for systematic theology. Um, uh, don't really worry about the term systematic theology. Let's just call our course doctrinal foundations. We are looking at different Mr. doctrines, foundation of our faith. Uh, yeah, just a minute. Yeah. Pardon? I didn't get it. Sister, I have that book, Systematic Theology, on e, e, uh, this thing, you know. So there's an entire chapter on inerrancy in that. In fact, you have oh. detailed chapters on every single doctrine. Um, oh, OK, sister. Yeah, so uh, yeah. I'll so find our, it no problem. Because when you were reading, I felt we didn't have the notes. I didn't know where to refer. So I just wanted to clear. Yeah, so yeah, Thank you, you can. So um, those of you who are not familiar with Wayne Grudem, if you just simply type Wayne Grudem PDF in your Google search, it will give you a link where you can, uh, you know, which you can click on to download the book. It's available everywhere on the internet. It's a very easy book to access. Okay, so uh, now there are other more modern books. Um, Millard Erickson, his he has got more, more little more modern English. Also, the way he writes it is a little simpler. I will put all those details in the you know, stream page. All right, so uh, you can refer to that, uh, but that will not have all the stories and the facts and stuff which I'm talking about because those are all things which I have picked up from a whole bunch of different places. But the basic doctrine, at least, you will find in these uh, books. All right, so um, yes, coming back to our topic, we were discussing God, the Creator, who is eternal. Now, when we are talking about the eternal nature of God, it is understood that all the three persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three are eternal. Because the wrong doctrine that is preached by certain, certain cults is that they say that Jesus had a beginning. God the Father created him, is what they say. So we need to be very, very clear that all the three persons of the Godhead are eternal. None of them had a beginning. All of them were there everlasting to everlasting. So, you know, um, which is basically what we find in John 1.1, 1, 1, where it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So, um, in the beginning, God was already there. He was already existing. So having understood that, in, in that context, keeping that in mind, if we could have someone read out for us Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17. Colossians 1, 15 to 17. Now, he is the exact likeness of the unseen God, the visible representation of the invisible. He is the firstborn of all creation. For it was in him that all things were created, in heaven and on earth, things seen and things unseen, whether thrones, dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created and exist through him, by his service, intervention and in and for him. And he himself existed before all things, and in, and in him all things consist, cohere are held together. Yes, this entire passage which we read out just now is talking about Jesus and verse 15 is, this is what verse 15 it says, the sun is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. So people take this verse and they say, look, it says over here that Jesus was the firstborn. Now that is a very wrong way of understanding this. You know, we again need to understand when these words were written by Paul to the Colossian believers, did they, how did they understand that word? Was it a word which was familiar to them? And if it was a word which was familiar to them in their culture, how were they using that word in their culture? How did they understand it in their culture? Um, so, uh, firstborn, only son, all these are legal terms which talk about the inheritance rights which are given to the only son. The firstborn is the one who will inherit 
he has the special legal rights to the property so these are terms which were technically used which is why we see in genesis chapter 22 verse 2 when god says to isa uh, to abraham take your son your only son whom you love and you know he says to go and offer him as a burnt offering so over there why is god saying that isaac is his only son it's just a legal technical term that is being used god is well aware that abraham has got two sons so when he says only son he's saying i'm talking about the only one who has been appointed with the inheritance rights that's the only son i'm talking about sacrifice him not not your other sons that is the son that i want you to offer as a burnt offering which is why in john 3 16 god so loved the world that he gave his one and only son over there it's talking about how this jesus would be the one um who would be the uh, under whom the entire creation would be placed the entire creation would be his inheritance no, which is what we are talking about over here in Colossians 1, 15 to 17. He is the firstborn over all creation. It is his inheritance. This entire creation is his. So over there, it's not talking about someone being born as the first son. It's talking about the legal status of firstborn. Um, and it, in fact, goes on to explain very clearly in what sense he is the firstborn. So it says in verse 16, in him all things were created so it was in him through him that everything was created in that sense he is the firstborn of creation he is the one uh, to whom all of this creation belongs this is his inheritance so it's a technical term that is being used over there when it says firstborn it's not talking about someone who was born on a particular day Yes, in the flesh, when Jesus chose to become human, he was born in human form. But when it comes to his existence, he was always there because in him, all things were created. And it goes on to clarify at the end of that verse, verse 16, it says, all things have been created through him and for him. So all, everything created is his inheritance. It's for him that everything has been created. So. Uh, we choose to understand these terms firstborn only son all these as legal technical terms which talk about the inheritance given to the uh, to the chosen son who will be given the entire property the second um, um, attribute of god which we will look at um, god is self existent you know, now that we talked about how God is creator and he's eternal, uh, in line with that, we can also maybe talk about the self-existence of God. Um, if you were to look at Exodus 3.14, this is how God chooses to describe himself. Exodus 3.14, if someone could uh, read out. Exodus 3.14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am and what I am, and I will be what I will be. And he said, you shall say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So God doesn't need anyone to continue existence, existing. He's not dependent on anyone to exist. He can be whatever he wants to be. He always was and he always will be. He is self-existent. On the other hand, we humans are dependent on him for existence. Only if he permits us to be conceived, you know, the baby will be conceived. And the baby will go on to grow and, be, you know, uh, become a man or a woman, uh, a grown-up. So we depend on God for our existence. And if God wishes to take away our breath, you know, we will die physically. So... Uh, we are dependent on somebody for our existence, but he is self-existent. He doesn't depend on anyone for his existence. He always was, which is why he says, I am who I am. I always have been. 
I can be what I will, uh, what I, what I choose to be. So that term I am, which he uses, signifies those things. It talks about how he's always been there, and he doesn't need anyone, need anything to exist. Um, so in line with that attribute, let's look at one more attribute of God. God is infinite. That means there's no limit to him. He's limitless. So um, let's look at you know the three infinite aspects of God, which generally you know people talk about. They talk about the omnipotence of God. You know you may be familiar with those three terms, right? Omnipotent means all powerful. Omnipresent means that he's everywhere, and omniscient means that he knows everything. So let's look at those three um, you know, infinite aspects of who God is. Uh, God is first of all. He is omnipotent, which means he is all powerful. There are no limits to his power. His power is limitless, which is nice. It's good to know that we are under that under uh, an all powerful God. But do we have any access to this kind of omnipotent power? Okay, not omnipotent, but at least you know power, the power which God has. Do we humans have any access to this great power which God possesses? Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. What does it say? Hebrews 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Yeah, uh, we, we, we're just focusing on that first phrase where it says, the word of God is living and powerful. So God is omnipotent. He is all powerful. And some of that power is actually placed in the scriptures because the words which he communicated through the prophets and through the writers, you know, for them to write down, he put his power in those words. Now, I'm not saying that every single wor word in the Bible is omnipotent. No, let's not go and you know, make, make up new theories and new uh, doctrines. No, all I'm saying is that we worship an omnipotent, all-powerful God. And some of his power actually is residing inside these verses, which are accessible to us. So when we take a stand of faith on these verses and we fight through in prayer and we claim what is said and promised in these verses, the power in these verses is released to us in our situations. So how do we gain access to this omnipotent God? Through his verses, through, through the promises in scripture which he has presented to us because it says in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and powerful. These are not just dead words. These are literally living words. If you take these words and you hold on to them in faith and you claim them and you use them to fight against the principalities and powers, these are living words which have the power of God inside them. So I'm not saying that we will you know, gain access to omnipotent power. Please let's not you know, get into wrong doctrines. But I am saying that his power has been made available to normal humans like us through his words. There's power in those words. So never think that these are just some long dead promises that God made long back. No, his words are living and they are powerful and we can access his power through these, um, you know, through these Bible passages which are there in the word of God. Um, let's look at something that is said in Luke chapter 1, verses 36 and 37. A statement that is made about God's power. Luke 1. 36 to 37, if someone could read out. And listen, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is now the sixth month with her who was called barren. For with God, nothing is ever impossible and no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. Okay. Um... Is that in some way amplified or something? Let's not use amplified just for our classes, simply because uh, they expand the verses, verse to an extent. It uses a lot of words which were not there in the original at all. You know, so 
um, yeah, we will we will use N N N K J V N I V N A S B. I mean, any N will do. But uh, let us just, for the sake of our class, not use the amplified because it adds words which are not there in the original. So if you were to you know, just look at N K J V, uh, it says, "For with God, nothing will be impossible." What amplified was trying to do is trying to bring out the meaning of what is said in that phrase. Nothing. uh with with god nothing will be impossible because you see in the previous verse what was said is that this lady elizabeth who is too old to have any child such a lady is now in the 6th month of her pregnancy and in that context this sentence has been written with god nothing will be impossible what is the what, what's the what's the uh, messenger trying to say he's saying God opened his mouth and spoke and made a promise to Zechariah and said, "Your wife is going to have a child." So when God says something, it will happen. So whatever He has spoken, He will fulfill. So for Him, nothing is impossible. So amplified when it said, "No word from God will ever fail," you know, it added that explanation over there. It was trying to show what this what this phrase is actually meaning. which is why niv uses the same method in your niv if you were to look at uh, luke 1 verse 37 it says for no word from god will ever fail that's basically what the messenger was trying to indicate god said something to zechariah and once god says something what he has said will not fail the words that he speaks will be fulfilled no matter how impossible the situation may seem and so uh, you know niv says no word from god will ever fail but yes the literal translation would be what is there in the greek with god nothing will be impossible okay so um, we can have access to the power of god through the words in the bible even we claim them whatever is promised in those verses will be ours you know because god backs up his verses with his power um so we come to the second omni which is god is omniscient um which basically means that god is all knowing now again this is an attribute which can mean a lot to us you know personally to us believers because uh if god is all knowing it can make life much easier for us isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 if we could have someone read out this very very familiar passage isaiah 55 verses 8 and 9 isaiah chapter 55 verse 8 for my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are your ways my ways says the lord verse 9 for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts the mind with which we have been created we humans the human mind is very limited it can only understand some things it can logically try to work out some details but it doesn't understand everything on the other hand our god it says his thoughts how high are they than our thoughts it says for as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways higher than your ways my thoughts than your thoughts so to my human mind a certain situation may present itself in a particular way but when god looks at that same situation using his all knowing mind his omniscient mind he is able to see that situation in much greater clarity than me so i may think look at that situation and think oh my goodness now i'm now my life is finished look i am in, in a terrible crisis but the god is looking at that same crisis with his all knowing mind he can probably see a hundred ways of how that thing can be resolved so if we place our faith in this living god and submit to him and say lord i will just follow you and obey you however terrible a certain situation may seem rather than you know uh, allowing myself to go into anxiety i will choose to trust you to take me through this because your mind is higher than mine your thoughts are as higher than my thoughts as the heavens are from the earth how high are the heavens how many meters how many kilometers high are the heavens infinity heavens go on and on infinitely high 
God's thoughts are infinitely higher than our thoughts. So we can have this deep assurance that when we commit our situations to him, he's going to work it out in his time, according to his timetable, because his timetable has been planned according to his all-knowing mind. Okay, so uh, we were only able to look at two omnis today. We will look at the third omni and, and many other attributes of God. Uh, those of you who are in um, Google Classroom, please look at your stream page maybe by evening. Um, and then uh, later on when this video is posted in the e-platform, anyone interested can co you know, contact me on the e-platform and I will give them the details uh, if they are interested regarding resources and things like that. All right. So let's just quickly close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much that an all-powerful God like you chooses to become so personal with, with imperfect, uh, temporary human beings like us. Even though you are awesome and infinite and completely uh, great in all your ways, you choose to be with people who are so limited. And you went to the extent where you gave your son as a sacrifice and he emptied himself and chose to become like us, limited. And a, a limitless God who chose to become limited for our sakes. We thank you, O oh Lord, for your great love towards us. Someone like you can be trusted always. No matter what you ask of us, we can trust you and obey because you are that kind of a faithful God. Thank you, O oh Lord, for this. In Jesus' name, amen.